I'd like to open up the Wakely Finance Committee meeting of January 24th, 2023. It is uh, 6.03. My name is Paul Antea. I am at this point the chairperson of the committee. Uh, we'd like to have everybody else introduce themselves. Jim Herkendall. Dan Kennedy. Brenda Dorty. Don Wiley. And here is oh. our administrator assistant. Yeah, Brian. Brian and administrator. Uh, Amy, Amy LaValle is here. Okay, so we'll open up with the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is to discuss and vote to reorganize the finance committee. Okay. Um, could you elaborate on that? So each year we, we probably want to elect a chair, a vice chair, and then a clerk. That's correct. Um, I would like to put this off to the next meeting when we have a more Tom will be back and hopefully we'll have a full we'll have a full crew and everyone can put their thoughts down. Did, is that agreed upon? Sure. Everybody feel good about that? I agree. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, to review and vote to approve meeting minutes from November 15th, 2022. If we all had a chance to review those meetings, yeah. I make a motion to accept the meeting as written. Second. All those in favor? Uh, do we have to take a. Do we have to take a. Um, there's no Zoom. We don't have anybody participating remotely. Joyce is on Zoom. Hi. One of you is roll call anyway. Okay, to uh, roll call for that vote. Paul Antea, yes. Jim Kirkano, yes. Dan Kennedy, yes. Brenda Doherty, yes. Donna Wiley, yes. All righty. Okay, so meeting minutes passed. Now we'll do a municipal finance overview and weekly financial trends by our own town administrator, Brian Domino. The annual report, so to speak. The annual report. <clears throat> um, so just as background, this is something I've been doing for a couple of years. Um at the beginning of our process here to try to just set the table as the how things are looking um, back in the past to sort of project forward what what issues we might have or issues we might not have. Um, so we will get into it. And below. <clears throat> the first part is sort of meant to be educational about you know municipal finance overview and a little bit about Prop Two and a Half. Um, I think that's helpful to review or for folks to hear that watch this video. Um, so municipal finance overview. Um, we have six categories of revenue that the town collects. The tax levy um, is by far the largest state aid is all sorts of money that we get from the state, education, unrestricted local aid, charter tuition reimbursement, school choice tuition. Um, there's all sorts of types of aid that we get from the state, albeit in my opinion, insufficient. But nonetheless, it is what it is. Local receipts are um, money that we get, that um, really local receipts, money that we get from um, residents or others in town that is not um, the tax levy. So the largest one is motor vehicle excise tax. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, reserves, so those are um, free cash and our stabilization accounts. Um, Debt and then other sources, so grants and things like that. And categories of expenses, operating budget. So I've tried to highlight the things that we have the most control over. Up to the operating budget that's adopted at the annual town meeting, we have control over. We have capital expenses. So these are usually one time larger purchases, non capital expenses. Um, but those are really any purchases that don't, I, that we don't qualify as capital expenses. State and county charges, 
Um, if we had prior year deficits, which we don't, we would have to make those up in the current fiscal year in allowance for abatements and exemptions. So that would be money that we set aside for abatements or exemptions that are granted by the Board of Assessors. So revenue, again, sources of revenue, local, uh, local tax levy, state aid, local receipts, and all other. So this is anticipated revenue by source for fiscal year 2023. So this is the current year we're in. This looks the same almost every year. Tax levy makes up almost three quarters of the local revenue that we take in. State aid is 12%, local receipts are six, and all other is 8%. So no surprise to anybody here, tax levy is by far our largest source of revenue. Um, tax levy and tax rate, how they're calculated. Um, it's pretty simple. We take our total expenses and we minus our non-property tax revenue estimates. And that's what we need to generate for the tax levy. Unlike the, um, yeah, I was going to make a joke, but I won't. Um, and then to sort of calculate the tax levy, we, uh, the, the tax rate, we take our total tax levy and divide it by our total assessed value in town. Total assessed value is generated by the Board of Assessors through a prop through the process that they use to assess property. Um, so 1420 per 1000 in assessed value was the tax rate for 2023. And it was a 49 cent increase from the prior year. Um, my box is going to be in the way. I got to move this. Maybe it's on the other side. Ah, there we go. Alrighty. Too many computers. So, look, the tax levy. Um, it went up 200. $20,000 and some change um, from 2022. So that's part of the reason why the tax rate, we saw the tax rate go up um, that amount. So you can see it kind of fluctuates a little bit, but 4.9% um, increase um, is probably not something that we want to keep having to happen. That's true. Um, so a little bit about Proposition 2 and half, as there's always a good deal of confusion about, about what it is and, 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 and how it operates. Um, so generally speaking, it's a limit on the amount of new tax dollars that a town can raise from year to year. Um, so it creates what are called uh, levy limits. It creates a levy ceiling and then a levy limit. Um, so the, the two restrictions are that a community cannot levy more than two and a half percent of the total full and fair cash value of all taxable real and personal property. So, oh, it's the other way. I'll get to it after. And then the second one, so that's the levy ceiling that is so there's a, a levy ceiling and it's an amount that we cannot tax above. Um, a levy ceiling, it's a hard ceiling. We cannot go past it. Um, overrides and debt exclusion don't help. Um, so the second limitation is what's called a levy limit. Um, and that is um, a constraint that, that we can go past with an override or a debt exclusion. So really this chart is what it looks like. Um, this is the levy ceiling. It's two and a half percent of the community's full and fair cash value. So our total assessed value, we can, we can tax up to two and a half percent of, of that. Each year that increases. So each year our levy ceiling in theory would increase. Municipalities and some cities have gotten into problems when their total assessed value starts decreasing. Um, and the levy ceiling starts coming down. <clears throat> That's not a problem that we have had here. Um, so the levy limit is the maximum levy um, can be in a given year. 
and what how that's calculated is it's based on two and a half percent. So you take two and a half percent of the prior year's levy limit. So that's this amount right here. You add what's called new growth. Um, new growth is um, it's really you have the growth in your tax base from new buildings or essentially new buildings or additions. Um, so it's it's not created from just the assessors increasing values on a certain category or certain type of house. Um, so it's, it's it's what's called new growth. Um, so why that's important is it's, you take two and a half percent from the prior year's levy limit plus the new growth. Um, and that creates your new levy limit. Um, and the left, so the levy limit is what we are able to tax up to. So our uh, lev our tax levy was around 4.7 million in FY23, and we could have taxed up to 5.8 million without um, the need for an override. This is one of the things I want to highlight, and this isn't in the in the paper packet because I was looking at it. So this is certified new growth. And this is a trend that started to worry me um, because I think we could see it coming and certified new growth. Again, that's for new buildings or additions, right? So in town, we had the industrial park here. We had Pine Plains Estates where we had all this, new, where all this new building was happening. Um, so for, I, I think for a number of reasons, we're starting to see our certified new growth slow down. Um, and as you can see here, the trend is, is, is negative, right? It's 23, it was 40, let's say $46,000. So that means our levy ceiling is growing slower, right? And, um, uh, I mean, our levy limit is growing slower. But we're um, not close to it. No, we're not close to it. Um, but it's not going up as fast. Right. Our levy limit is not going up as fast. Right. Um, unfortunately, I think what's happening is our, our levy limit is going up slower and um, our expenses are going faster. So we're going to start to see some, some strain on that and it, it'll, it'll show up in, the, in one of the slides here. Um, so in terms of prop two and a half, again, two ways to get above the levy limit are an override, that's for the operating budget, and then a debt exclusion um, or capital outlay expenditure would be for a significant high cost capital project. But we can exempt that from prop two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what I was talking about. We're, we're starting to see some pressure on our, what's called the excess levy capacity. And the excess levy capacity is, is the levy limit minus our tax levy. So it's how much we could, um, how much more in taxes we, we could, could generate without needing to do an override. Right. Um, so what we're seeing on, on this chart here is our excess levy capacity decreases, right? From, from yep. 20, 22 to 23. Um, our assessed value still went up, but they didn't go up as much. Um, so that's what's creating this. It's actually resulting in a decline in our excess levy capacity. Right. I mean, really, what happened was our levy limit increased by one hundred eighty-eight thousand, and these are rounded numbers. But our tax levy increased two hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's going to create a, a reduction in your excess levy capacity. Yeah. And one year is not a trend, uh, but it's just something that we want to keep an eye on. And also you see this period of, you know, this kind of period of steep growth here in our total assessed values between like 17 and 20, really 21 here, 22, there's kind of, and that's starting to level off here. So that's something that we're going to want to watch. Um, May I ask yeah. a question? This is probably more about the way the Board of Assessors does its work. Um, I don't know if every property in Waverly was this affected by this, but many properties had their assessed value go up a lot between 2021 and 2022 because of that little blip of kind of crazy buying, the pandemic, 
Um, yeah, and if you go to not very reliable sources like Zillow, <laughs> you know, that's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just a blip. Yeah. Um, and, and Zillow is not a reliable source. But um, I don't actually know how. I understand that our assessors use in part state mandated um, formula. But I don't. I don't know when there'll be an accommodation for that because it does seem to have been a blip and not seems like it's going to go flat for a while and it may even go down. <laughs> no, we it don't know. Down. We don't know. I don't know. Which will only thing. make this problem more acute. I think. Yes, no. but I don't know is how much of the decision making is in their hands. I, I don't either. I I kind of think they are guided definitively by what Boston state guidelines they have. And, and as you said, the driver of this is the marketplace, right? right. You know, what it was like following the pandemic and, and where we are now. So we have very little to do but to watch it. Right. And um, so. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is local tax levy. So this is excess levy capacity compared to our surrounding communities. Waitley is in good shape today, um, especially compared to some of our neighbors. Um, so it's a good spot to start from, and it'd be a spot that we would want to try to stay in. Um, again, so as you know, some of the things that 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 influence this are are property values and things that are about outside of our control. I think that's a handsome picture right there. And I think a 10 by 12 out in the hallway would be, <laughs> would be you know, proper. But others may not think that. Um, tax rates. This is my annual disclaimer that tax rates don't mean that tax bills, lower tax rates don't mean that tax bills go down. Yep. Um, you remember back to one of the, that earlier calculation about how the tax rate is calculated. Um, the more total assessed value that you have, the lower your tax rate is gonna be. Um, so if we increase the total assessed value, really sort of what happened was it two years ago when I think the average increase was about 12%? Um, it drove the tax rate down to 1371, right? Because we had a it was a reval year and we had a huge increase in total assessed value. But we didn't have a lot of new growth. So it's the same people paying the, the, the taxes. Um, just the burdens probably shifted a little bit because because we've increased people's total assessed value a little bit differently, but but nobody paid any less, right? Um so while it's a you know it's historically low right now, it, it's also because total such values are historically high, mm -hmm. um, and we had that big increase in total set value, so it drove the tax rate down. Um, but still, it is where it is where it is, and people like to look at it. Um, again, this is comparison of surrounding communities. Um, Waitley is still pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I always put the disclaimer on Deerfield at the bottom that they got to add a dollar and some change for their independent districts. Um, so the one that's there's fourteen ninety seven is about a dollar and some change higher than that. But we don't want to rub it in. So <laughs> uh, some of us do. But um, so really, this is a better indication, I think, of affordability and tax burden. Um, because tax rate went down, like I said, the tax rate went down, but it didn't necessarily mean that people paid less taxes, right? So this is the average single family tax bill. Um, so we're seeing an increase of about 200, um, $238, I think, um, from 22 to 23. So that's, you know, that's an increase that, that people are paying. Um, you know, I've heard anecdotally that that I've heard a little bit more anecdotally that that it probably was a little bit more of a burden this year than 
than previous years. Um, but those could also just be one offs too. Um, yeah. I think we get a lot of that much time. <laughs> yeah. A lot of one off. Uh, maybe it's because COVID ended and more people are starting in, but or X cost or X cost seven dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a general strain on it. And yeah. Brian, this says single family. This is not this doesn't include the corporate tax. This is just this is private residence. Average single family tax bill. It is what it says. So the, the total, so it's around it's around 365,000, I think, is the average single family value in Waitley. That's um, a good number to know. And it's it's fairly similar in the surrounding towns as well, within a couple of uh, tens of thousands. Do you maybe maybe that's coming up on another slide? Do you know how many taxpayers are in Wakeland? I don't know how many of these taxpayers there are. Yeah, we, we can get that from. Um, um, there's 835 households. I was well, going to say there are about 850 households. Okay. There was seven, a few years ago, it was, you know, in the 700, somewhere in there. But um, yeah. You know, yeah, I think mean, that would be well. So you're thinking about 830? I think it's 834. Yeah, don't quote me on that. Though. I can get you that number easily tomorrow if you want. Um, so this is uh, showing average single family tax bill of Waitley and the surrounding towns. Um, and Waitley did increase um, $238 you know, over the prior year. <laughs> Um, but that seems to have been an increase. Seems to have been the trend um, in the area. Deerfield's up two nineteen. Sunderland's the only one that 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 saw a decrease of thirty three dollars. Williamsburg was one fifty six. Half of it was two hundred five. Um, so Whitley wasn't alone in seeing an increase. But again, it's, it's something we keep smaller. I think it's, it's better for folks, especially with all as Donna mentioned, all the other financial strains that. That people are experiencing now. Um, let's switch to state aid. Um, state aid was better in 2023. It was in 21 in 22. Um, it was kept lower, artificially kept lower from the state. There was a lot of uncertainty regarding um, tax collections, if you don't remember that, at the state. Um, so they promised us that they would keep it level with 21. So yay. And it was pretty level. Um, turns out at the end of FY22, the state had a $1.9 billion surplus. Remember that. So did you get your check? No, did you? I, I thought one would come in with Waitley with extra state aid money, but it never did. Um overpayment of taxes. Yeah. So Hopefully, state aid. We obviously have a new governor who has been elected. Um, part of the strain, and we'll talk about frontier later in their timing, is that my understanding is that when there is a new governor that takes over, um, the deadline, and maybe it's a deadline all along, but I, I think they're looking to file their bill by early March, the budget. So it's coming in a lot later than, mm -hmm. than we normally see it. Um, so that's part of what's going to put the time crunch on the, the review. But anyways, okay. um, total state aid, and I'll, I went to the, the Mass Municipal Conference this past weekend, and I have a little bit of insight to share, but um, in terms of state aid, but we can talk about that when it comes up. Unrestricted general government aid. Um, this is what it sounds like. It is money that the town can use in any manner that it chooses. Um, for the prior administration, they promised that it would go up um, other would go up equal to the increase that they used um, to project for the state budget. Um, so if they were calculating a 3% uh, increase in, uh, not the budget, the, the revenue, if they were calculating a 3% revenue, the state revenue, then they would increase this by 3%. I don't know what the, what the current administration is going to do, but we will find out. Um, state A, Chapter 70. Um, Again, we've got $271,820, not even close to enough. Um, so what I've heard is that, what I heard at the conference was that they're 
aiming for a hundred dollar increase per student. Um, because our enrollment is so low, we have about 120 students in Lately Elementary School. This will get us, you know, about thousand dollars. Not huge. Um, so it's not really much to think about. Uh, school choice tuition. So school choice receiving versus sending. And this is the graph. School choice is a winning. Uh, winning proposition for Whaley. Um, in 23, we're estimated to take in 213,000 and we're estimated to pay off 20,000. So we keep attracting students in the elementary school to fill empty seats. Do you have Frontier in here? I don't have Frontier in here. Um, charter school tuition. This is a losing proposition for Whaley, financially speaking. Um, 23, we are estimated to be, be reimbursed 42,000 and we're going to pay out 103,000. Um, I had heard from at the conference that at least the goal was for the new administration to fully fund charter schools. Um, charter school tuition reimbursement would equal costs. I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but I heard that is a goal. Uh, that would be nice for us, mm -hmm. um, but we will see what happens. You, you mean the state will be fine? Yeah. Okay. That's how it should be. And there was also a, there was also talk about a goal of the administration being to fully fund regional transportation. For the first, I think it's, well, for the first time in a long time, let's put it that way. I don't know that it's ever been fully funded. Um, like the law says it should be. Uh, so next class of revenue, uh, local receipts. Um, is what it is, we saw a little dip in, in 2022. Um, we thought that might be the case just because of um, the situation with the pandemic. Um, so this is our local receipts by source. Um, Motor vehicle excise tax is by far the largest local receipt that we bring in, 62% of local receipts. Um, solid waste fees are 7%, so that's essentially the, the transfer station and pay as you throw. Um, other excise tax is 6%, so that's meals tax, that's rooms tax. Um, what is, what's not included here is cannabis excise tax, because we have zero retail shops open. Um, Hopefully that will change this year. I say that every year, and every year I'm wrong. Um, but they've also changed the laws on those retail shops as well. So the windfalls that we thought we were going to have when all of these agreements were done, that's changed completely. My expectation is that the community impact fees, um, that we won't we should not count on any community impact fee. We can count on the 3% uh, cannabis excise tax once these retail shops open. And I am more optimistic this year than I am other years. I know yeah. one, one of the locations is fully built out um, and is in the process of being sold to a different, a different group. And then the other one, as far as I know, is continuing, continuing to work uh, to get their retail shop open. So I'm talking about the sugar shops. The, yeah. I call them the red side and the gray side. Yeah. Um, the red side has been built out for a while. Um, and there were issues with there were legal issues with with the with the the former owner um, in terms of having that corporation. Um, my understanding is that the corporation had too many licenses, essentially. And you dug down really deep, it was, there were too many licenses um, for um the uh, the one person so they were they were they were selling some of those sounds there's difficulty um with the with their ability to um to purchase or to acquire product made in the state i don't believe so no no i, I there's a limitation in how many licenses that someone can have yeah um and I think what happened was when the state peeled back the layers of the different corporations and LLCs, I think there was a, uh, 
uh, a, a person who was, I don't know what the proper term is, but um, they wanted this group to divest the, some of their licenses too. Is that flurry that we saw at the beginning, pawn shops opening up everywhere, that's really subsided. Yeah. The rate of growth is, is just kind of gone away. And uh, and I just personally wonder if it's because of the product or unable to get as much product. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly, but I don't think that's, at least that's, that's not a reason that I've heard. On the on the red side, that's that's the the company that um, they should have had their second season of growing um, on River Road. You know, they have a, a cultivation and they have a process in manufacturing mm -hmm. um, establishment on River Road. And I believe this is probably their second year of harvesting. Um, and they, as far as I know, they intend to to open um, sometime in the summer. I think. Um, okay. Just, just, about fingers crossed. just to go back on the on the committee impact a lot did change um and it made it more difficult it it made it more onerous for communities to to collect that fee yeah um and there, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding that so um I just heard at the conference that um the city of Pittsfield was was recently sued um for 1.5 million dollars to return community impact fees that they have previously spent. I don't know how that will, will play out in the wow. courts, but wow. and I guess they're also being threatened with another another uh sue. retailer to um, to also sue them for their community impact fees that have already been spent, from what I understand. Um so there's a lot of uncertainty here. Yeah. And yeah. for us, a lot of uncertainty or not a lot of money. So um, it's it's something that the, I think this court will have to grapple with in terms of whether it's actually worth it. Yeah. Um, and this is all other. So this is the last category. Right here. This is all other. A spike in eighteen and nineteen. So anytime, anytime we access, you know, our free cash or or, or other reserve accounts, it's going to show up here. So this was the town hall historic town hall rehab project where this, this money shows up as as revenue, but it's money that we've already had in our accounts. Um fence friends. Any questions on revenue? I should add that. Pretty interesting stuff. Um expenditures by sorts. This does really does not change year to year. Um and this is for FY22 because that's the last full year that we have. Um education is 54% of our budget. Um general government is 11 percent Public works is eight fixed costs, so that's insurance, uh, retirement, things like that is twelve percent. So it's actually our second largest, um, second largest category of expenses. Police is five, fires three, other public safety. So that's going to be scams is two. I assume this breakdown is not available for other towns, neighboring towns. Um, it will. It, I could get it. It's. Yeah, it's on a website called Municipal uh, Municipal Finance Trend Dashboard. Mm -hmm. Um, you can get it for all three fifty one pounds. Uh, I, I can tell you that education is by far the biggest, sure. the biggest expense, the biggest expense for most times. Hopefully, oh, sure. Um, so total expenditures. This is how much money that the town has spent. Um. 2022 was uh, 5.57 oh, 5 million um, and it's growing up, uh, going up um, slowly, but the, I mean, it, it keeps increasing, it gets more expensive to run the town. Um, total expenditures surrounding communities. Um, fiscal year 2022 is blank for. Um, three of the towns because they did not get their data in yet. Um, because there is a acute shortage, well, it's probably more than acute shortage of municipal finance professionals. Um, and that was another theme at the conference, wasn't we're having a really hard time finding body experienced people yeah. that 
mm -hmm. to do this kind of work. Uh, but that's just one of the examples where they where they can't get there. Schedule A is how you report your expenditures, and they just can't get it in time. Um, we are lucky, but we are on the edge of a retirement that kind of be difficult to replace when when retires at the end of February. Um, but anyways, total expenditures, um, we, we he is really the lowest. Um, and I like to think we spend the less, but we have the equivalent or better services. Um, because I, I really do think that, especially the police. If if somebody from the fire department was there, I'd say that. I know. All right. <laughs> um, education expenditures. So we're spending around three million dollars. Um, so these are um, education expenditures, which are look pretty closely aligned to the budget, but not the exact. Same. Um, so total education expenditures. This is this is just for the elementary school versus total chapter seventy eight. Um, totally insufficient chapter seventy eight. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the gap if these trends continue, which they probably will. Um, and even the hundred dollars ahead is not going to do much um, for us. That's why mm -hmm. just increasing chapter seventy eight without fixing the formula doesn't help rural schools. Right? Um, but that's a whole another discussion. Um, but this gap is going to continue to widen. Um, it's just not sufficient, and the cost is going to of, of running the school is going to is going to keep going up, and it's going to keep falling on the tax level. Do you know if our representatives are doing anything to try to stir the conversation about the formula? Yes, they are. There was a, a rural schools policy report, and um, yes, there there's a lot of discussion about finding different ways to fund uh, rural schools. Forget the name. There's actually a. Uh, I think there's a bill that is being proposed or, or has been proposed. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. The specific name, but yes, it's a it's a huge issue in the western part of the state. Um. So other categories of expenditures. Again, this is fixed costs. So we're a little bit lower in, in 22, um, 20, and 21. If you remember, I, I believe those are the years where we had zero um, increase in health insurance costs yeah. because the trust was um, spending down some of its, excuse me, spending down some of its assets. Um, but that's done. So um, I heard the projection is 6% mm -hmm. um, increase in health insurance costs. Um, so that would be about $24,000, $25,000 that we would Okay, for the same health insurance that we got last year. Right. Um, total debt service payments. This is the one good news on 2020, 2022. Um, we had zero debt payments. Nice. Of course, in 22, we appropriated, we authorized debt for the purchase of a wood chipper and excavator. Right. So 23, we were paying um, $48,000, and that's where we are right now. Um, but still, no long term debt. No debt on, on municipal facilities, um, no debt on expensive fire trucks or highway department trucks. So mm -hmm. again, that's something that we know don't those things don't last forever. But as long as we can stick with our plan of trying to purchase these items on a schedule, we won't see this up and down of mm -hmm. you know significant debt. Hopefully we can keep that at a manageable level. Um, Free cash certifications. Um, so what we're working with this year is uh, $593,000. It's a little bit lower than um, previous years, but we also we also left it a little bit lower than we did in previous years. And by left, I mean, in the past, we used to keep around $200,000. We, we flip over around two hundred thousand dollars, and I think this year we flipped over around ninety thousand. Um, but we also moved a lot of that money to stabilization, stabilization accounts. So mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense yeah. um, to see the number. I actually thought that number would be lower, yeah. um, but um, that's what it came in as. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Okay. Um, takeaways. So expenses for um, twenty twenty four. What I know. Um, Franklin Tech, I think, is going to be a pretty significant hit 
Um, I haven't seen the budget, but I got a heads up saying that our enrollment is plus 10. Um, so that's going to be a big increase. Um, I always say this in, every year. And it, it's going to increase by 10 or increase to 10? Um, it's going to my it's going to increase by 10. So we're going to have plus 10 students. So how many students is that? I don't remember what the total is, but it's it's a it's a it's going to be a big number. Um, I don't know. If the, I don't remember if he told me what the total enrollment is, but it's around eighteen thousand per student. So, mm -hmm. um, free cash to tax levy. Um, some people agree or, or disagree with this, but we spend free cash to reduce the tax levy. Again, we're we're, we're spending a one time a, a one time revenue source on recurring costs. It artificially keeps the tax rate lower and the tax levy down. Um, so depending on people's philosophies on that, that's good or bad. Um, but I, it's just something that we need to highlight that if we can't spend two hundred fifty-five thousand dollars in free cash, you know, to reduce the tax levy, then we're going to see that the the tax levy in tax what people are paying taxes go up. Um, new revenue possibilities. I talked about the marijuana excise tax. Um, ARPA, so what we call CLFRF, uh, Whitley received $458,000 mm -hmm. in ARPA money. Um, we still have $258,000 um, in CLFRF monies or ARPA money that remains unobligated. Um, so last year we we, we took a lot of the capital projects and we funded them through um, ARPA. And, I, and we'll have to discuss okay. how we want to do that. We can do that again this upcoming year. Um, so, and just when we talked about the certified new growth earlier, I've had this concern for a while. A lot of the, the, the areas where the town had been growing are full. Um, Fine Plains Estates, we had the houses on Dickinson Hill Road, the really expensive houses up there. Um, the industrial park is essentially full. There's a vacant lot down here that's owned by Cavestro Bear, uh, but they have no interest in, you know, that's future expansion for them, mm -hmm. hopefully someday, hopefully for us someday. Um, so we need to find areas where growth could happen. Um, what do you mean in the town? Yeah, I mean, the town overall, yeah. right? Um, so we do have a planning study that, that received a grant for uh, to look at the exit 35 area. Um, so from the diner north to the uh, the Deerfield town line, um, okay. supported by, you know, well, the town line is sort of the railroad tracks, right? So the past railroad tracks, but the railroad tracks uh, to go north. Uh, we can't really go south because it's really wet. Yeah. Um, so the idea is to look at some of the area around there um, to see, you know, see what could happen. It's yeah. could be developed or redeveloped, right? Because um, at the time we, we thought about it in 35, the, the sugar loaf shops were still essentially essentially empty, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there was some some there was some some minor yeah. Yeah. what about south on five, five and ten? Any, Once you get past the diner, it's pretty much the Great Swamp. I mean, um, what about past that, though? When you're heading down towards... Uh, then you hit Zanoni's. Yeah. Um, you hit the Mayo. Um, and as you go further, I mean, that's right now, that's not zoned. So well, so it so brings us to the question, where are we with um, the DeMaio property that the town owns? And... Moving forward with that somehow. Um, I have the impression that the well, I told that the conservation commission thinks that property. I mean, they're cattails there. It is wetland. Yeah. You know, it's uh, you don't have to be a scientist to know. Yeah. Just look at what's growing there. The wetland can be changed. They've done it with that. So, so there is a. Um, as, as part of a as part of a, a, a grant, we do have a um, a wetland delineation that's going to happen there. 
um, and they're going to develop scenarios where they could actually, we're going to look at where it's, what's actually developable or not in this spot um, on, on the denial lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. When? Sooner? Um, yep. I had this, uh, a scoping session with the, uh, the engineer from BHB last week. Um, so that would, that would give us a better idea of what, how much land is actually available there. Considering septic and that kind of thing. There's water, but there's obviously no sewer. So, right. um, while we're talking about businesses, um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who woke up to the news from um, Yankee Candle, which in fact doesn't sound bad for us, but the initial <laughs> announcement sounded scary. How, how vulnerable are we? What share of our revenue does Yankee Candle produce? Um, I don't know that. I mean, my head about <laughs> is the plant going to be affected? Well, apparently not. No, no. It's apparently it's all set to appeals. But the, but the, the this is office. the second time that parent new parent corporation has downsized in right. a few years. I'm just, I mean, it's a point of vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a big yeah. Tax it, it is. Um, Do they pay a hundred thousand? Do they pay fifty? No. No, they pay a whole lot less. Um, my understanding is that they, I want to double check this, but my understanding is that they don't pay personal property taxes to the town. So it would be, it would essentially be real estate taxes that they would pay. And, and, and while the building would still be there, so there would still be some, there would be some tax revenue. I think the, um, I think that the harder impacts would be the, the, the fallout from it, the loss of you know, the loss of jobs and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, they do. I, I'd have to look, and, and we were talking about it. No, that, that's what I was really here. asking in general. Not, not but really. I mean, the three largest, the three, the three largest are, are Yankee, Berkshire Gas, and Investro. Yeah. But I'm still not. I mean, I didn't, you know, listen to the news intently on this, but I sort of thought that it was just that corporate office mm -hmm. that's that right. where whereas the retail shop and the manufacturing were going to be okay so that, that's what they said right they are reducing facilities and staff in other locations yeah. as well that have nothing to do with massachusetts but it sounded like they didn't uh, they're not interested in, in owning the real estate anymore yeah yeah, they're probably letting people work from home. Letting people work from home. Yeah, and true. I think they're, they're downsizing yeah. also. So, yeah. um, COVID proved they could. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. I, again, that's just a general concern. Yeah, we're out having a manufacturing facility where right. you, know, you can't do that from home. You cannot. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, you know, they have been, they have been expanding there. Not, I, I shouldn't say they've been, been expanding the plant, but they've been making a lot of upgrades to the plant. And they just, the the upgrade of the of the, the electrical system on Christian Lane was a Yankee. Well, it was a Yankee candle paid for project, so they could bring more power to the to the plant there. So uh, they're still making investments in that plant. So I guess that's one indicator that they plan on being there for a couple more years at least. So um, right. And these are our uh, stabilization accounts. Um, so that's where we are with those. That looks all good. Um, one of the things that um, we're hopefully going to start work on is um, a feasibility study for a new highway garage. Yep. Um, you know, and so I'm going to be meeting with a couple. Um, of the engineering firms that have done some work in the surrounding towns over the past five to ten years that one recommended to me to try to get a handle on what those costs would be. Yeah. I think the general takeaway, Brian, and tell me if I'm going down the wrong path here, but based on things that we've seen, is that new growth is kind of plateauing. Our costs continue to rise, and we we want to avoid not having a gap there. So it's 
it's going to be uh, it's going to be you know finance committee working with you know the rest of the town I think to uh, to see that expenses are even pace with what we can pay and trying to keep us away from that point of um, not having um, the cushion of that new growth as we move forward. So when we look at new initiatives and when we look at um, new expenses, I think we have to look at them very uh, critical eye as to is there a, a definitive need for these expenses. Not that we haven't done that in the past, but I think it's it's incumbent upon us now to um, to really make decisions as to what we feel is in the best interest for the entire town financially. So that's all. Thank you, Jim. Any com any comments? Um, does anybody want to? I had one comment. Sure. Um, nice. I just I'm always impressed with um, the presentations that Brian does, and I think one of the reasons that we're in such a good position is because of the quality of the people that we hire, the people who work for the town. We have a pleasant workplace, and people get along with each other. Um, we unfortunately lost Hannah, um, who was sort of bringing in, I don't know, N times her salary, where N was a pretty big number um, in terms of grants. Uh, I think one of the things Brian mentioned that uh, being able to do the wetlands delineation at the DeMaio property was uh, at least in part funded by a grant that Hannah got for us. So I, I just want to um, say that as we go through this budgeting period, that we should keep in mind that uh, our top-notch employees are one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in and I hope we will keep that in mind and treat those employees well as well as we possibly can under the constraints that we have thanks okay thank you um I forgot can I say one more thing sure because I did total up so yep um FY22 was the first year we funded the community development position um and we found somebody in October of that year. We found Hannah, who has since left for Somerville um, for quite honestly double the pay. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's something that we as a small town will always battle. Um, always. And you know, I think my understanding, and Amy can correct me if I'm wrong, it was a fully remote position for really about double the pay. So um, nobody blames her for going. Um, but so since the beginning of FY22, the town applied for and received a total of $785,000 in grants. Um, so that was a number of grants that are going to really help us. Um, right. And really, we, it, that position cost us over that time period, 112000 That's looking at salary and benefits. So yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of grant money that's out there yeah. at both the state and federal yeah. level. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of other towns are starting to realize what we what we realized two years ago is that mm -hmm. if you invest in a position like that, it's going to pay back multiple times. Um, I agree. So I agree. I also think that um, in, in regards to um, you know a position like that, a position like that is very competitive, and we may as a town have to say that we want to compete in that space and that um, we will appropriate certain monies for that for that person. We also think that salaries should be there should be a zip uh, there should be a finite there's going to be a cap on it. There's going to be a cap on salaries. So um Salaries and positions have certain values. I don't know what those are, but that position you're speaking about 
and a position of an aide in the elementary school in terms of value to the town are different. And so are the values of most positions within the town. There's a certain value to the town that those positions have. And I think we need to take a hard look at that and as a town say, we are gonna increase, and I don't know what that number is, but we need to increase our salary pool by X. And we have to live within that X. And that if this position requires more funding, then other positions have to be modified in terms of increases. Because not everybody is going to increase exponentially over time. And I, I, I just think as a town, that's something we need to embrace. Um, there are key positions and there are positions that are not as key. So a great deal of that has to do with the select board and what they feel is all town employees report to select board. Um, but I can't see a finance committee taking direction from a select board that says, we'll pay whatever we need to pay to keep people on board. That's probably not going to happen. So that kind of discussion is what we have to have. It's not, it may be uncomfortable, but we're all here for the same reason and to make things better um, and affordable um, for everybody in town. So I hear you and that there are some positions such as that position that has paid for itself many times over. Um, but your presentation also showed us that where new growth is going, where our expenses are going, and that's something that we have to have, we have to get a hold of and have a direction. Um, so all those conversations are coming up, they're coming downstream, but um, that's my two cents on that. And I'm open floor to anybody else who'd like to speak to that or any other thing regarding um, Brian's pre-presentation or anything else. Any... Paul, Donna? I, I have um, a question about a, a different matter, but it has certainly has budget implications. Um, I sat through the school presentations last year to this committee. And I always go to town meetings, so I've heard other presentations. Um, I have not ever heard a nice, clear answer to the question, how many school-age children are there in this town? How many are being educated in Waitley? How many are being educated elsewhere? And what do we think about that? Mm -hmm. What do we think about, I have a neighbor whose 16 year old goes to Northampton High School. I mean, I, I happen to have a lot of neighbors whose kids are being educated either at other public institutions or some at private institutions mm -hmm. and some homeschooled, you know, which sure. is a different choice. But I've never seen a nice, clear explanation. This is our history mm -hmm. and, and this is our current situation. And what do we think about that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, do, that, do we, and I don't know, maybe that's a question for the school committee. Absolutely. I mean, it's really not for this committee, but it would give me confidence when I see that up and down, tuition in, tuition out yeah. record. Right. Give me confidence right. to know that someone's really tracking that yeah. and has an opinion about whatever the situation is. I think there certainly are individuals that have those numbers, and those are what... Sh what Donna just brought up is something that should be on the um, agenda when the schools come in, so the schools can give us a clear and concise picture of um, enroll enrollment both here and out. Um, and we should know that um, without question. Um, 
while we're on the subject of the schools. Okay. As you know, the Finance Committee every year has to look at the school budgets, both Frontier Regional High School and White Whateley Elementary School. And more often than not, we get those budgets. There have been years when I received that budget the day we were going to meet these people, which is totally unacceptable. The best that it's ever been is maybe three days before, maybe. Much of that has to do with the fact that Frontier Regional High School is mandated by the state to have their budget prepared and ready for the first annual town meeting. 45 days before that meeting, they have to have the budget ready. The first meeting this year is Deerfield's town meeting, which is in April. Um, our town meeting is when? It's going to be sometime in May. Sometime in May. Um, Conway has pushed theirs off to either the end of May or beginning of June. So, so the point is, if the town meetings are pushed further up in the year, um, then Frontier doesn't have this crunch time. And we have more time as a finance committee to look at what their submissions are. So um, I was going to run this by everybody here. I was going to put a short letter together from the finance committee to select board that we recommend that our annual town meetings be held the last two weeks in May. Now, I don't know when, when are they planning on having it? This so they voted to, to, to extend it to, to sometime in May. My, my recommendation, I think, is, is May 23rd. Well, that would be great. Um, but so, so the other, the pushback that, that I think we're going to get is, and again, it's a conversation that needs to happen, right? Yep. Um, is that there's also another, there's another timeline if a town needs anything related to Prop Two and a half, like an override or debt exclusion, there's a notification period that needs to happen to the town clerk, right? So town meeting happens, you vote to put a let's say a debt exclusion on the ballot, on the yeah on the ballot, right? right? There's I think it's a 35 day notice period to the town clerk. So right now, town meeting in April. Let's say we did a debt exclusion for capital item, right? Um, 35 days. We tell the town clerk. It gets on the annual election, mm -hmm. right? If we don't hit that 35 day window uh, because our town meetings pushed back too far, then we have to call a special election for anything related to two and a half. That's not insurmountable. It can be done. It's just yep. that's the other competing side of it, right? Is the, the efficiency part of it and the, well, and the cost part of it of not calling a special election. Yeah, I, I, I just so, think that. So uh, that might be the pushback from other towns. We're not too. Hard up against two and a half right now with the excess levy capacity, things like that. Well, as we know, accounts might be Conway. I spoke to them, so I had a meeting here with Conway, um, Conway, Deerfield, um, finance com com committee people, and we had this discussion, and they were in agreement. Uh, a couple of nights ago, I spoke with Carolyn Ness, select person over in Deerfield. And she is behind it 100%. They cannot change it this year because uh, annual town meeting, date of annual town meeting has to be agreed to and passed on town floor. But she agreed. Mm -hmm. she, no, that's, Our town that's, council uh, believes otherwise, but that's all right. Well, we don't yeah. need to argue with you. Right? Yeah. But she's in back of this 100%. And, you know, she says that, uh, that right now school costs are inching towards 70% of their, of their budget. And um, anyway, so that's, uh, so she's in back of it. Um, so how do you feel about having a letter from the finance committee to the select board saying that we feel that having, are we supporting Brian actually, and having that meeting on the 23rd? Brian, you good with that? But do you think this 
that we need to formally put a letter together to send to the select board. I know Joyce is here. I, I think if it's your recommendation that you would want town meeting. So ideally what we would do is if we were to move it, um, our bylaw says the last Tuesday in April. Town council has said there's a law that says that the select board can delay it. Um, so that's why I think Deerfield could delay theirs if they wanted. To. But anyways, we, we disagree. Um, so there's a question of, of whether we would want to amend the bylaw to change it to that date. Um, so that's a discussion that they would have. If it's a recommendation from the finance committee one way or the other, I think that would be relevant. Okay. Again, I think the argument from the town clerk would be on the other side about two and a half in special elections. So, and then it would be for the select board to decide what they yeah. want to do. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the school budget aspect of it, and I was sort of talking about this a little bit with with uh, with Dana, I think you know a lot of a lot of their budget is related to expenses. You know, there's expenses that are known now. Right. Yeah. In, in regardless of what the governor's budget says in March, uh, and I know some of those expenses can can be shifted or or, or taken off, but uh, it it just seems like a review could happen earlier, at least on the expense side. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. I don't know that people need to wait until we see the the, the governor's numbers because the, the, those aren't certain either until mm -hmm. the budget adopted. But um, that's just all I know, on it. all I know is that the people of the town of Wigley do not have any board um, with critical oversight on any school budget. You know, there is, um, I watch the meetings and there's a great deal of agreement. Um, and... and <laughs> And anyway, and by the time we get the budget, in order to make a change in that budget is uh, pretty much too late. So if we can push that meeting back and we can get agreement from Frontier and Waitley Elementary that their budgets can be submitted in a timely fashion, then I think that it's, uh, that it's a win for the taxpaying public. Well, I think that would be a win, but the on the other hand, in knowing the school committee up there, they may utilize that extra time they before might. they ever give us the budget. That's so true. We may be, mm -hmm. you know, moving the mm -hmm. canoe to the other side of the river, but you yeah. still need a paddle. Right. Well, that can be outlined on that can be requested well not just not just you know from a request standpoint but if there is an agreement on their part to try to help us do what we're supposed to do then the individuals on those commi committees those decisions have to be known by the voters of the town yeah and we can easily outline that at the annual town meeting with the finance committee report. So we can, I mean, that's where you do it. And if you want to have that discussion on town floor, more than happy to do that. Would it be reasonable to suggest a joint meeting with the school committee? When? If we're really hoping to talk into oh, you know, to, oh to do to yes I, this committee to be together with the school committee because yes. that, if if there is to be some back and forth mm -hmm. I think it would be better to have it with ten people in the room yeah. than you know with one hundred twenty people mm -hmm. or one hundred eight you know when it's really you know when doing something about it would be pretty dramatic yeah on the floor of a town meeting. I'm saying joint meeting all finance committees. No, I was thinking of the elementary school. Oh, okay. sorry, I was thinking of the elementary school with the school committee. Yeah, I, the... I don't mean to ignore Frontier, but that's so much more complicated. Yeah. No, we bring up a good point. Are, are they are they two different? They're two different committees. Aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's overlap. And uh, I raise this point with Brian. You know, so often when we meet with the schools, we meet with them on the same night. 
you know, switch like fly through one and fly through another, and that we should separate them. We should have Frontier in at one one night and maybe elementary school on another night. And um, so that we can concentrate on the school that's in front of us and use that time wisely. Um, so I, I think that's certainly an option. Um, but Dan, you're right about the fact you know, we have to get some buy-in yeah. that, that this yeah, extra so time is going to be used effectively. Right. right. So that we'll... If we go through this effort to move our date, they better not. Mm -hmm. They oh, they did that. Now we can extend yeah. ours and drag our feet some more. Well, Deerfield looks like they're going to move their date. Conway has already done it. I don't know what Sunderland's doing. Yeah. Um, but if you have three of the four towns that have moved the date, and now you have a school committee and an administration that's not putting a budget together in time again that's a problem yeah. oh, i think it's worth it right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely okay. question George? Yeah. uh no i just uh, mostly a comment i i don't think i can speak on behalf of the whole select board but we always welcome comments from anybody in town and if you all put together a letter to that effect i think it would be greeted with I don't know, palm fronds and flower lays. And and I, I think we're really on the same wavelength regarding um, the the town meeting being in April being kind of a budget problem. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, so I, for, for not necessarily the same reasons, but similar reasons, that's why we said, let's put it off until May. We didn't pick a particular date in May only because we we wanted to give that a little more time to, and get Brian to help us figure out what's going to work for the budget process. So um, I suspect your 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 letter would be welcome and um, and and I, I I'd love to hear it when other people agree with me. So yeah, okay. I, th I think everybody here is in agreement with that, and we'll put one together and we'll get it out to you. Okay. Um, Okay. Items not anticipated. So, um, okay. How about the? So we have the frontier letter that everybody I think had in the packet, right? Oh, okay. Which pretty yes. much said yes, yes, yes. yes. Which right. I, I, in that, I think that was a good conversation to have. Before, yeah. Before we look at that, it essentially says our time could not our meaning frontiers time constraints are such that you know. Essentially, there's going to be a public hearing on March 7th, and there's going to be a vote on March 8th, I think, right? Right. right. And it, so it's a done deal. Copy in the pile. So right. it doesn't sound like they're going to be visiting us before then, because they're going to get final budget numbers at, yeah. in early March. Mm -hmm. And because they have a 45-day window, mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like it's sort of a take it or leave it. Right. Um, public hearing March 7th, that's a that's a meeting that we had um we had reserved right. um as 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 a date. Um so I think we could if we wanted to scratch that March 7th one and just plan to do the frontier hearing. I I think that would be fine. I think we have enough wiggle room in, in terms of our budget review that we could we could do that. Right. Um so I, I don't know what Thoughts, okay. thoughts people have about that. Yeah, um, I I think we could do that. Any, I think we need to do that. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to be there for sure and see what comes out of it. Um, but um, will we receive the budget before the hearing? That's the question. Will we be able to look at it? Uh, to formulate questions before they go up on the screen. You know, I'm in lock. You know how I feel about that. So, um, well, let's send a letter to uh, Darius and uh, Shelley and say, or no, not Darius and Shelley. Here's the other thing the school administration do not report to the town. 
Yeah. School administration's report to the town to the town school committees. Okay. The town school committees vote on the budget. So in essence, the school committees should know the budget. So the school committees could should come in here and have that discussion with us about the need for the dollars they're asking for. And whatever questions we have regarding that budget, we should be able to ask them and they should give us an answer. Now, if they need to have a school administrator or um, a business person, then that's on them to ask them to attend the meeting. Um, now, Brian, I don't know if that makes more work for you or less work. I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, I mean, as it's been in the past, the most I can do is make a request. And well, you know how those have gone in the past. To um, right. But if you request to the chairman of each of those committees, rather than the right rather than the actual administration, um, and have the school committee make the request of the administration. I think that is how that ball needs to bounce. Oh, there's a chain of command there, that's what we should be following. Exactly, yeah. that is the chain of command. I'm not, based on experience, I'm not sure the results will be any different, but I'm willing to try. But what if the request went directly from the finance committee to the school committee? I do that. Is the school committee so that this is just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't have, I, I would prefer to get it much earlier. The school committee is dependent on the administration for the budget. So the administration doesn't have it in the school committee design. Right. And but, I don't think, then I don't think it, it, it sounds like, at least in terms of Frontier, it doesn't sound like they're going to have something that that is going to be available much earlier than that. Um, now, there needs to be, and there's going to be Frontier Committee, there's going to be Frontier School Committee budget subcommittee meetings. There was one um, already. So, I missed it. So the budgets, they looked at something at that meeting. I don't know what it was, but that should be public record. Um, so if we wanted to take a look at that, that should be something that should yeah. be accessible. I don't know what it is. Uh, in the past, they've been reluctant to, to release it, but if somebody or some committee that starts with finance committee lately wanted to push the envelope and request those documents, they would have to be released. They would have to be provided freedom of information act right yes. okay, that's worth a try it's worth the try um, there's a there's a there's a uh, a tremendous reluctance with that um you know to, to give up those at least in the past and i'm not saying anything that, that that's that yeah we haven't already experienced right is um, bob howler still the chair yes i believe the way we I, I believe the frontier oh, chair frontier. and vice chair of frontier are both Whitley representatives. Yeah. Which again might not allow so the Whitley School Committee. Um, Maury Nichols is the chairperson for Whitley School Committee. Of now I don't think we'll have much of a budget crunch with the elementary school because we have there's not that same 45 day requirement. So, right. Um Okay. All right. And I, and I don't know if that, that budget subcommittee was a, a full budget or not. I have, I have no idea. Yeah. But presumably that, that budget subcommittee needs to put something together to recommend to the full committee. So mm -hmm. that's just one approach then. Okay. Um, so do we agree we're going to attend the public hearing? Yes. I mean, I well, let's take a vote. We should that. attend the public hearing, I guess. Um, what's on the floor is, um, do we agree to, um, uh, move from our March 7th meeting to the school committee meeting at Frontier for all those who want to attend? 
Paul Antea, yes. Jim Kirkendall, yes. Yes. Linda Doherty, yes. Yes. Okay. So that's what we will do. Yeah. So I'll 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 post the I'll post the meeting so you guys can meet there as a minion. Okay. All right. Save whatever's in your heart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or not, because it's not. recorded. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, are we good with that? We're good. Okay. The agenda, we're pretty much done with the agenda. The only last uh, uh, one thing I'd like to uh, to take a look at is our calendar moving forward. Uh, I know we talked about the 7th. Obviously, today's the 24th. We have a meeting on February 7th, February 21st, March 7th. Is going to be is now going to be the frontier meeting. Then we have the 21st of March. We have April 4th, April 18th. Then we have a contingency of uh, <clears throat> May 2nd. Um, and May 9th is the select board regular meeting. Okay. What's that got to do with us? Right. That's when the warrant signed. So okay, that's when the warrant signed. Yeah. Okay. So of the um one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight meetings, the the um the finance committee is meeting by themselves as a group, as a committee. One two two times. Right? Is that? And um, how did you stru structure that? What was the uh, what was the uh, the guide? Um, so any time that we have um, essentially department heads coming in, yeah, to talk about their budgets, yeah, um, that's when we wanted to have the joint meetings. Okay. So that there wouldn't so that there'd be the information would be heard by everybody. Okay. Involved. Okay, so you wouldn't have to make them come back twice. Right. Okay. Um, so we are meeting. So then essentially, as a finance committee, we will be voting on the 18th. Um, on the budget. So that's a that's a must date. And then if need be. If we need to carry that vote over, we can do it on May 2nd. Um, yeah. Okay. All righty. And um, that's it. So for me, huh? Brian, you have anything you'd like to brace us with? No. Um, any any progress on the sale of the corner score of the um, school? Responses responses out are due in uh, January thirty first, thirty fifth, thirtieth. Do we have any? I'm not optimistic. Of, do we have any as of today? No. In the in the event those do not materialize, there's no interest to do. That. What direction do you think that's going to go in? Private sale? I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. It's a discussion, I think, for the select board to have. Um, yeah. Are we done? Yeah. All righty. I make the motion to adjourn. Thanks. All those in favor? Paul and Taya, yes. Dan Kennedy? Yes. Yes. Brandon Doherty, yes. Yes. That was that was Donna. Yes. Okay. Adjourned.